Hello and welcome to week three, unit eight of the Open SAP course on the circular economy. My name is Darren West and I'm the Business Development Director for Circular Economy at SAP. So you've heard a lot now about business models. So when we think about business models, they have to create value. And how is this value shared? So who benefits from these business models? So in this unit, we want to look at how value in the circular economy can be shared not just for privileged communities, but also for historically marginalized communities as well. So this is a concept that we sometimes call social capital. So this is what we want to cover in this unit. And in this unit, my colleague Mike Jordan, who you met in previous weeks, meets John Holm. And John is Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at Pixera Global. Um, Pixera Global are an NGO that specializes in driving systemic change in the circular economy. And what they like to focus on is this question of value and how value can be shared more fairly. So let's jump to the interview right now. Hey, John, thank you so much for your time and insight into this important topic of so social inclusion in the circular economy. It's really valuable for our, our course. For the first question I wanted to ask you is around the way the circular economy discussion is typically framed. When framing the circular economy discussion, it's usually around circular business models, so upstream and downstream models like product as a service, sharing platforms, um, uh, uh, resource recovery, circular inputs, etc. those kinds of topics. But lost in that discussion is any talk about equity and the economic opportunity for the most disadvantaged and how circular economy can be a, a model for um, an inclusive business. Could you provide your thoughts on why this is the case um, and how the circular economy could be framed as a systemic transition to a, a more inclusive economic model? Yeah, Michael. So first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be here. Um, regarding your question, it's a really interesting one. And I think that when, when you unwrap or unwind the circular economy conversations, I think most of the discussions today revolves around waste. So when you look at the circular economy spaces, what can we do to recycle waste, make waste more sustainable, turn waste into product, which is all great. Um, I think that we, we really need to do and focus a piece on that. But as what you said earlier is, is, is crucial. Uh, the transition to a circular economy is systemic. And while much of the discussion now around the current sustainable social issues that are pressing, for example, in agriculture, we're 50 years away from topsoil pretty much being gone, which means we can't farm for fruits and vegetables, or climate change we're dealing with front and center, or, or, or what we see right now with the earth and, and the current sustainable environment is that we need to transition to a new um, economic platform that is definitely more nurturing to our planet. In that context, the circular economy is talked about in that space. But I want to focus the conversation on another part that's really not discussed as much as it should. And that is that, that inclusion piece. Historically, marginalized communities currently are not involved in the current take, make, waste, linear um, economy. Um, they've been excluded from it, and it seems that it has been excluded on purpose. And so I think when we look at the transition to a circular economy or an inclusive circular economy, it's really to try to take in context that this is a new opportunity for these historically marginalized communities to take ownership of that new economic platform. And let me just dig in a little bit to highlight or provide some context of what I mean. Um, in Edgar Villanueva's book, Decolonizing Wealth, he paints a pretty grim picture of how the system is rigged against the historically marginalized. So let me just paint a picture for you. Um, the management of financial services currently is 81% white. 86% of venture capitalists are white and 96% of angel investors are white. On the other side of it, in the United States, a measly 1% of venture capital funding goes to the Latinx and black community. Those numbers are striking. And for us, when we look at transitioning to an economic model that is just, that is correct, that is nurturing for the environment, we need to put front and center those folks who have been participating in it as a transition to really enable this transition to a new economic platform. John, those are really sobering statistics. Um, thank you for providing those. I'd love to drill in a little bit to find out what you're doing at Pixera Global. So at Pixera Global, you, um, you talk about um, uh, uh, convening, designing, and co-creating inclusive and regenerative um, 
uh, circular ecosystems. Could you explain what that means? And perhaps could, could you give some examples of how your work enables this um, circular transformation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you for that question as well. You know, Pixera Global owns a unique piece of real estate in the global development space. Um, you know, our mission is to unite the public, private, and social sectors together to solve solvable problems, uh, working closely with these sectors to really go deep and try to build partnerships to enable this change. And so obviously, when you look at the circular economy space, it's going to take all of us working together and coordinating together to do just that. And so what's really fascinating about Pixera Global is that we really work closely with our private sector partners to help enable that transition to work with them to focus upon how their business can solve the social problem, not just a public relations story. And I think that's critical when you're talking about this transition to circularity and all this talk of ESG metrics, et cetera. So when we look at really what does that mean, convene, design, and co-create, um, what we look at doing is when we go to a given geography, we identify those specific stakeholder partners that we need to work with on the ground to make an ecosystem transition. I think the first thing you need to know about, though, when we look at a part, when we look at the, the circular economy space, is we go and focus the, the historically marginalized community group, front and foremost. So whether that's working in Alaska and Montana with tribal nation and tribes, or in Ghana with waste pickers, or in some of the cities we're working in the United States with historically marginalized Black communities, we focus and primarily focus on them to be the benefactor of that transition through an economic state. And I think the other thing to look at is when you look at convening this conversation, it's really important to have the right actors. That's why being great partners with SAP on the technology space in all of our projects is critical or working with groups like Metabolic um, who have a really science-based approach to the circular economy space is key. And so, and I think when you look at our space, we are not just, we're not the primary implementer. We're the ones convening and bringing those um, ideas and those potentially solutions to market and scale. Thank you, John. That's super interesting. Um, so going on to my, uh, the next topic, um, there are so many interesting initiatives and, and programs happening around um, ups, upcycling, for example. That, so um, some of the bigger brands in, in sportswear and sports shoes are taking plastics and integrating them into their clothing and into their, their shoes like Puma and Nike and Adidas and Reebok, etc. Um, my um, my concern and my question is, how are those disadvantaged communities at the bottom of the pyramid involved with this and, and are they benefiting from this at all? Well, I mean, this is a really tricky question, right? And when we look at taking plastic, first of all, plastic is an artificial commodity. Um, the cost of new resin, until the cost of new resin is more expensive than the cost of recycled content, it's a manufactured marketplace. So while taking plastic and putting the technology to turn it into product is great, those companies that you listed, they make some pretty nice margins on that move. So they're able to take some recycled content of plastic, which is great. They employ right now waste pickers who are critical to the plastic ecosystem, the procuring product for them. And then they sell that product at a pretty good margin. So while it has a really good um, value to the world, the marginalized, the historically marginalized, they're not really benefiting from it, except for being able to pick up plastic and get some money from it. Um, I think when you look at the circular transition, we got to really start looking at how can they take ownership of those businesses, not just get a handout, not just get some money here and there, but what type of reduced, reuse, regenerative innovations can they put in place moving forward? And I think, you know, you do see some companies out there really trying to make a concerted effort to be regenerative, to really look at those products as a service models, to really try to change from selling light bulbs, for example, to selling light like Philips does. But there's a lot more work to do. And I think until we really allow those historically marginalized community groups to take ownership of it and feel they truly have buy-in and a seat at the table. A lot of this talk at the moment really is just a lot of public relations. Mm. Um, that's super interesting. If you if we take to, together some of these horrifying stats about the fact that it's basically white men like me who, who tend to have all the influence and the power in making decisions around this stuff, and um, the disadvantaged communities have very little involvement and get at the moment uh, relatively little benefit out of it. This, this kind of leads me to my, my last question. Um, I, I'm sure you would agree that um, most corporates these days have an idea or a working definition of what the circular economy is. And uh, um, a lot of companies are starting to go into in that direction. Um, and yet the marginalized communities in many cases, I, I, I suggest, were, have been doing 
reuse, recycling, repair for such a long time. And yet they're, they're separate. They're not part of the core conversation around the, the circular economy. How do you think, given all these other things you've been enlightening us about, how can these communities start taking ownership and become more centrally involved in, in the circular economy conversation? Great question. It's a really fun one. I mean, I think let's first of all look at what circularity is, the circular economy is. This is not new. So regeneration, maximizing um, the resources of a product or um, a service has been around actually before the Industrial Revolution. If you look at tribal nation, for example, and tribes, they worked very closely with the earth on making sure they're using every single, maximizing every single piece of whatever they were working on to its fullest value. And I think when you look at that, I think we generally speaking, and me as a white male, but as I think the capitalistic society needs to step back and say, this isn't new. How do we include those folks who've been doing this for years, centuries, to be able to take part in that and lead it um, and use that technology? Um, So I think it's important, first of all, to focus on that. How? Well, I think one thing that is critical is that when we, and an example is when we convene these communities ourselves, we are their advocates. We're not there to prescribe medication. We're not there to tell them what they need to do or what social issues are they need to, to focus on. We listen to them and we find out what the circular conversation means to them. So for example, in some of the tribal communities, if they have an issues with, um, with uh, housing, how can we look at maybe taking um, recycled content and making uh, convex homes um, affordably? So there's solutions, but those solutions have to come from those folks on the ground and allowed to be able to create, innovate, and own those solutions themselves directly. John, that was such a useful set of insights into this uh, social inclusion issue and, and so essential to this course. It's so easy um, at a company like SAP and others to just think of it as a, a new idea and with a bunch of technology enablers. And in fact, these marginalized communities have been doing this so long and their stories of how they've done it should be central. So we really appreciate your input. Thank you very much. No, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it and uh, happy to be a partner of uh, SAP. Hey, time's flying. That was the last unit of week three already. So now you know more about business models and the drivers for change. So how can technology enable these business models? What is required? Technology is kind of an enabler for for all these things, and we're going to look at that next week.